One taken, one left. The wheat and the tares. The sheep and the goats. You've probably read the passages in Matthew chapters 13, 24, and 25 pertaining to those events. But what do they mean, and when do they take place? Greetings, I'm Dr. Paul Felter. Welcome to my video podcast where I expose church fallacies and flawed Christian traditions with Bible truth. We let the Bible speak for itself. Now, Jesus had something to say about the traditions of the Pharisees. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. That's Mark chapter 7, verses 9 and 13. The same applies to the church today. We have church traditions being passed off as Bible truth, and if you question those traditions, you're called a heretic. But those bogus traditions have the same effect as the traditions of the Pharisees. They make void or none effect the Word of God. Those that believe and promote church tradition over Bible truth negate the Scripture and its power to change the life of those that believe in Jesus. An example of bogus church tradition is our first passage, the one taken and the one left, supposed by many to be the rapture. Let's read the one taken and one left passage in Matthew chapter 24. But before we get to that passage, you need to understand Matthew chapter 24. Jesus was giving a prophecy briefing to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. They asked him, What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Matthew 24, verse 3. From verse 4 through verse 28 of Matthew 24, Jesus gives a high-level overview of the conditions and events of the seven-year tribulation. Verse 29 through 31 declare Jesus' second coming at the end of the tribulation. From that point on through the end of chapter 25, Jesus describes events that accompany his return using both narrative and parables. So, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 pertain to Israel enduring the seven-year tribulation and the judgments that follow Jesus' return. So let's read the one taken, one left passage, Matthew 24, verses 37 through 42. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Most likely you were taught, as I was, that those taken away are believers, and this event is the rapture. But what saith the scripture? In the preceding passage, Jesus likens one aspect of his return to Noah's flood. For 120 years, while building the ark, Noah warned everyone of God's coming judgment, but no one believed him. Noah was the laugh of the town, building a gigantic boat miles from any water. They thought Noah was crazy, seeing that it had never rained and a flood was unheard of. But one day the rains came. Noah, his family, and a thousand newfound pets were secure in the ark, and the door was shut by God. But what did Jesus say about those that were left outside the ark? They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Now let me be perfectly clear on this. Those taken away in Noah's flood were unbelievers, the ungodly lost. They did not believe God or Noah's testimony about the coming judgment, the deluge. The floodwaters removed the ungodly from the earth, and their souls are even now in Hades, awaiting the great white throne judgment. Jesus said it will be just like that at his second coming. Not another flood, but the removal of the ungodly from the earth. Two working in the field, 
one taken away to await judgment, as that person is an unbeliever, the other person left on earth to enter the millennial kingdom, as they are the believer, two women grinding at the mill, the unbeliever taken away, as in Noah's flood, to await the final judgment, and the believer left on earth to enter the kingdom. At Jesus' coming, unbelievers are removed, taken away from the earth to await judgment, just as they were in Noah's day. Believers remain on earth to enter the soon-to-be-established millennial kingdom, just as Noah and his family remained on earth to rebuild mankind. The word then, in verse 40, connects the days of Noah to Christ's return. Therefore, the interpretation must be consistent with both events, the flood and Christ's return. The ungodly are removed, taken away, while the believers remain on earth. In Noah's day, the ungodly were taken away by the floodwaters, Genesis 7, verse 23. At the second coming of Jesus Christ, the ungodly are taken away by the holy angels to hell's fire, where they await the great white throne judgment after the millennial kingdom, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Noah's family remained on earth to repopulate humanity. Believers at Jesus' return will remain on earth to populate the millennial kingdom. But even as clear as this is, some well-meaning but misguided pastors and teachers proclaim the one taken represents the rapture of the church. That's nonsense, and here's why. Number one, if believers are the one taken at Jesus' return, then only unbelievers would be left on earth to enter the millennial kingdom, promised to Israel. That's absurd. Number two, if the one taken event were the rapture, then the church will go through the seven-year tribulation, and that's absurd, as we are not appointed unto wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. Number three, the idea that the one taken is a believer, or the rapture, destroys the continuity between the days of Noah and the second coming of Jesus Christ. You must stay within the context of the passage, being the similarity between the days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is expressing a similarity between Noah's flood and his second coming, so we need to understand it, not reinterpret it to fit bogus church traditions or our erroneous opinions. The rapture of the church and the one taken events are completely opposite events. Here's why. Number one, at the rapture, church age believers are taken away to meet the Lord in the air and then up to heaven, as heaven is our final destination. Here are some passages to show we are destined for heaven. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3 verse 20. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Number 2. The rapture takes the church home to heaven. Believers go up and unbelievers remain on earth to endure the wrath of the seven-year tribulation. At the one taken event, believers remain on earth to enter the millennial kingdom, and unbelievers are taken away to hell, where they reside until the great white throne judgment. Number three, the rapture precedes the seven-year tribulation, as the one taken event occurs at the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation. Those two events are at least seven years apart. Number four, the rapture is a glorious blessing for the church gathered to meet the Lord in the air. The one taken event is a damning judgment for the lost that seals their fate in the lake of fire. It's easy to see that the rapture and the one taken event are exact opposites and mutually exclusive. Do not muddle these two events as that will lead to much confusion and misunderstanding. Stop trying to force scripture 
into the mold of bogus church traditions. Jettison church traditions and let the Holy Spirit speak through his word. All scripture is given by God. It is our job to study and understand the word, not to reinterpret the word according to the teachings of men. The Holy Spirit wants you to learn the truth. As Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24. If you are not worshiping the Lord in truth, rightly divided, then you are just playing church. Sadly, playing church is what most Christians in America do on Sunday morning. The truth will set you free from bogus churchianity. Okay, let's move on to the wheat and the tares parable. This passage is a parable, which is a fictitious story that reveals a spiritual truth. Also, Jesus states that the parable pertains to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not a kingdom in heaven, but an earthly kingdom, the millennial kingdom, revealed in the prayer Jesus gave to Israel. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. The kingdom of heaven will be established on earth when God's will is done on the earth. That's accomplished during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's read the parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit. Then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew thirteen twenty four through 30 We do not need to concern ourselves with possible interpretations for the parable. Jesus has given us the understanding in Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. That enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Now remember, Jesus is ministering to Israel as their Messiah. So this parable is for Israel, not the church, the body of Christ, as you will soon see. Let's deconstruct the parable. Number one, the sower is Jesus Christ. Number two, the seed are those that inherit the kingdom, Israel. We, the body of Christ, are not the children of the kingdom. Number three, the tares are the children or followers of the wicked one, Satan, the devil. Number four, the harvest of both the wheat and the tares happens at the end of the world, the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Number five, the reapers are angels sent by Jesus to gather both the wheat and the tares, 
Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. Number six, the tares will be gathered and burned in the fires of hell just after Jesus' return. Number seven, not just the tares, unbelievers only, but anything and everything that offends the Lord Jesus Christ will be gathered and removed from earth and cast into hell's fire with much wailing and gnashing of teeth. Number eight, but believers, the wheat, are gathered and will shine as the sun in the Lord's millennial kingdom. The phrases kingdom of heaven, children of the kingdom, and kingdom of their father used in this parable and the interpretation given by the Lord Jesus Christ refer to the Jews, Israel. Here are some passages to show that fact. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, 32. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my father hath appointed it unto me. Luke 22, verse 29. The church, the body of Christ, was never promised a kingdom. Those passages blow the kingdom now movement to pieces. The purpose of the church is to preach the gospel of grace, not the building of a kingdom for the Lord Jesus Christ. He will build the millennial kingdom upon his return. The little flock mentioned in Luke 12 verse 32 are Jews that believed in Jesus as Messiah during his earthly ministry and into the early chapters of Acts. However, with the final rejection of Jesus as the Messiah of Israel occurs in Acts chapter 7, with the Jewish council rejecting Stephen's message of Jesus Christ and his subsequent stoning. God set Israel aside temporarily and instituted the dispensation of grace via the Apostle Paul for the purpose of saving Gentiles. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, regarding the fall of Israel. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Romans 11, verse 11 and 12. The fall of Israel began in Acts chapter 7. But the prophecies pertaining to Israel, like the seven-year tribulation and the return of their Messiah, Jesus Christ, will commence after the church, the body of Christ, is removed from the earth at the rapture. With the rapture event, the dispensation of grace is closed, and the last days for Israel begin. The rapture completes the gospel of grace, so the gospel of the kingdom for Israel resumes, as stated by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Just as with the one taken, one left passage, the fulfillment of the wheat and the terrace parable occurs immediately after the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation. Next, the sheep and goats judgment. Bear with me, as this is a long passage. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came to thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. 
Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 25. 31 through 46. Let's deconstruct this passage carefully as it holds much information. Number one, the Son of Man shall come in his glory. The term Son of Man is strictly Jewish as it pertains to the man, Jesus Christ, who had a man to man or face to face relationship with Israel during his earthly ministry. We, the church, have a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ but we'll have a face-to-face -face relationship with him after the rapture. Our Apostle Paul never refers to Jesus as the Son of Man in his writings. That term was for Israel only. Jesus shall come in his glory at the end of the tribulation to save and redeem Israel. This establishes the intended audience of the passage and the identity of the sheep and the goats. Number two all the holy angels with him. Who returns with Jesus at his second coming? Holy angels. Apologies to those that have been told that the church will return with Jesus riding white horses, fighting against the Antichrist and the forces of darkness. I think God's holy angels are much better equipped for that battle than you are. Jesus returns with armies ready to fight. Revelation 19 verses 11 and 14. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation 19, 11-14 A fighting army of angels, not the church, returns with Jesus. The Antichrist's armies persecute Israel, during the tribulation. We are raptured before the persecution begins, so that's not our fight. It is the Lord's fight, and the Lord's angels will fight for Israel as they had in the past. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, they were all dead corpses. Second Kings 19 verse 35. The Lord uses angels to fight for his people Israel. I assume we the church will stay in heaven and watch the tribulation unfold from the mezzanine as the late Chuck Misler frequently quipped. Number three, he sit upon the throne of his glory. Shortly after Jesus' return, the fourth temple, the millennial temple, will be built. Jesus will sit on his throne in that temple from which he shall rule and reign over the earth. Number four, gathered all nations. After Jesus' throne is established, he will gather the nations of the earth before him for judgment. Number five, he shall separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Jesus will divide the nations into two groups referred to in this passage as sheep and goats. Number six, the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Already, we see things are not going well for the goats as they are on God's left hand. It is not good to be on God's left hand. Solomon spoke about the right hand and the left hand. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Ecclesiastes 10.2 Number seven. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, Ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Those on Jesus' right hand are the sheep, comprised of Jews 
and those that helped the Jews during the seven-year tribulation escape the terror of the Antichrist regime. Number eight, then the Lord Jesus explains why those set at his right hand were selected. When he was hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, and sick, they helped him. Then they responded asking, when did they do such things for the Lord? And Jesus responds, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Jesus is a Jew. His brethren are Jews. Those at Jesus' right hand are the nations that helped the Jews during the seven-year tribulation. They are allowed to continue as nations during the millennial kingdom. Number nine, the Lord Jesus then turns his attention to those nations on his left hand, the goat nations. Those nations aligned with the Antichrist in persecuting Israel and the Jews. Jesus commands them to depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Those nations and people refused to help Jews when they were hungry, thirsty, a stranger, imprisoned, naked, or sick. Their punishment is severe. They are cast into hell's fire to await the great white throne judgment. Number 10. As always, the evil go to everlasting punishment, hell, and the righteous to life eternal. It is clear that the sheep and goat judgment has everything to do with Israel and nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ. We might be spectators, but we are not participants in that event. Besides, Jesus is a righteous judge. He does not need our help. Another aspect is that when you see the word sheep with reference to people, the context is Israel, not the church. Here are some verses that support the statement. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Psalm 78 verse 52. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today if ye will hear his voice. Psalm 95 verse 7. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100 verse 3. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 6. My people hath been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains, and they have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Jeremiah 50, verse 6. Here are two verses from the New Testament. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, verse 24. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Mark 6, verse 34. The Apostle Paul never refers to believers as sheep, or Jesus as a shepherd. Jesus made the following statement with respect to who will enter the kingdom of heaven, the millennial kingdom. Not everyone saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 7, verse 21. It's quite obvious that the goat nations did not do the will of the Father in helping his chosen people, the Jews. Those nations will not, as we have read, enter the kingdom. The kingdom is for Israel, as clearly stated by Jesus in Luke's Gospel. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12.32 Let's summarize these three judgment passages. 1. In the three passages, the one taken and one left, the wheat and the tares, and the sheep and the goat judgment, the ungodly, the unbelievers, are removed from the earth. A. The one taken is like the ungodly taken away in Noah's flood. B. The tares are gathered up and cast into the fire of hell to be burned. C. The goat nations are also cast into hell's fire for eternal punishment. Number two. In the three passages, the one left, the wheat, and the sheep nations remain on earth to enter the millennial kingdom, enjoying 
a thousand years of peace and prosperity. The devil is bound in chains, and the curse upon the earth has been removed by the Lord Jesus Christ. A. The one left is the righteous believer that enters the millennial kingdom. B. The wheat believers remain and are gathered into the barn on earth, the millennial kingdom. C. The sheep nations also remain and enter the millennial kingdom. The ungodly are sent to hell. The righteous remain on earth to enter the millennial kingdom. The thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, followed by the great white throne judgment and eternity future. Pretty straightforward, I think, if you regard the scripture and disregard man's bogus traditions. Finally, these three judgments, the one taken, one left, the wheat and the tares, and the sheep and the goat judgment, all pertain to Israel. They have nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ. When these judgments take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ, we will have already been in heaven for seven years. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus.